A systematic approach to a patient with dizziness. A 51-year-old man presents to the emergency department with one-hour history of dizziness associated with headache and nausea. He has no prior dizziness episodes. His blood pressure is 159 over 89. Neurologic exam is significant for spontaneous, right beating, and non-suppressible nystagmus and is otherwise normal. EKG, basic labs, chest x-ray, and troponins are unremarkable. What should be done next? Approximately 4 million individuals visit emergency departments each year for dizziness. Up to 10% of these visits are attributed to cerebrovascular causes. The broad differential and risk of misdiagnosis of dizziness leads to overutilization of neuroimaging, which has poor sensitivity for cerebrovascular causes. The head impulse, nystagmus, and test of skew, collectively known as the HINTS exam, has been shown to have higher sensitivity and specificity than imaging when performed within 48 hours of symptom onset. The traditional approach to dizziness was based on qualifying the symptoms into syncope, vertigo, or other. This approach is flawed because patients have difficulty describing their symptoms and sometimes change the description on subsequent interviews. The ATTEST algorithm, A, associated symptoms, TT, timing and triggers, ES, examination signs, and T, additional testing, has a strong evidence base in the literature and allows for a more accurate diagnosis. The first step is to take a history and do a physical exam. If there is evidence of a general medical cause, toxic, metabolic, infectious, or cardiovascular, there is a diagnostic pause, and the exam can focus on nystagmus, dysmetria, truncal ataxia. If none of these are present, the medical causes can be evaluated and treated. For patients with a positive diagnostic pause, or without medical cause, history of timing and triggers can divide them into three categories. Acute vestibular syndrome, spontaneous episodic vestibular syndrome, and triggered episodic vestibular syndrome. Acute vestibular syndrome patients report persistent dizziness associated with nausea or vomiting, gait instability, nystagmus, and head motion intolerance lasting days to weeks. The most common cause is vestibular neuritis. However, a posterior circulation stroke can present similarly. The HINTS exam can help differentiate between both possibilities. If direction changing nystagmus, a normal head thrust test, or skew deviation is appreciated, this is concerning for a posterior circulation stroke. A unidirectional nystagmus, an abnormal head thrust test, and an absence of skew deviation suggest a peripheral vestibular cause, such as vestibular neuritis, labyrinthitis, or otosclerosis. Spontaneous episodic vestibular syndrome is characterized by recurrent spontaneous episodes of dizziness, usually lasting minutes to hours. Patients are not symptomatic on exam, and dizziness cannot be triggered. The most common causes are vestibular migraine and posterior circulation, TIA. Triggered episodic vestibular syndrome has brief episodes of dizziness, lasting seconds to minutes. Triggers cause dizziness not present at baseline. The most common causes are benign paroxysmal positional vertigo and orthostatic hypotension. The Dix-Hallpike examination and or supine roll test can help in the diagnosis. Nystagmus elicited by the Dix-Hallpike test with a delayed onset of approximately 10 seconds or longer and gradually resolving indicates a peripheral etiology such as BPPV. If lightheadedness, presyncope, or vertigo symptoms occur only on arising, it is suggestive of orthostatic hypotension. A blood pressure drop of at least 20 millimeters mercury systolic and 10 millimeters mercury diastolic within three minutes of standing will confirm the diagnosis. Now let's reassess our patient. He has an acute vestibular syndrome with spontaneous right beating and non-suppressible nystagmus. Hint's examination shows no direction change in the nystagmus, a normal head impulse test, and no skew deviation. Due to a concern for stroke given the normal head impulse test, we administer TPA. Right cerebellar ischemia is confirmed by DWI MRI 24 hours later. He is discharged on hospital day 3 with no residual deficits.
For more information about this and other neurologic conditions, please visit aan.com slash neurobytes.